think we're ready to roll. Good morning. I can kind of see you a little bit. It's kind of dark up there. But uh, so, as you guys probably, or you should know, we're on a, a series going through the uh, book of Ephesians. And uh, today, this morning, we're going to look at the second half of chapter 2. I'm following up Javier last week. I wasn't here, but I, I listened to his message, and it sounded great. So we titled this message today, Remember. Paul's encouraging us to remember our past, what the Lord Jesus has done for us, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, briefly today. So how about we pray? We'll do what we oftentimes do, take 30 seconds. If you would, bow your head, ask God to speak to you. If you'd pray for me too, uh, that, that would be nice. I would appreciate that. How about go ahead? Lord, we just really thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for the book of Ephesians. What a fantastic book. The whole Bible is, of course. Uh, Lord, we just really pray. Again, I pray that I'd be out of the way. Uh, I know nobody came here to hear Gary. At least I hope they did. Lord, we, we want to come here to hear from you. Pray you take these verses, open our eyes, our mind. Help us to be willing to alter our lifestyle in any way we need to, to be in, in line with you. Uh, Lord, I just pray that just by your grace, you would speak to us. Keep me from saying something stupid. Uh, I pray you just control my emotions, my words, my flow, the thoughts, everything, Lord, would be just committed to you. I pray it be as if Jesus himself was here teaching from the book of Ephesians, Lord. We just commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, thank you, guys. So, we have three main points this morning. We're going to remember, we're to remember what we were or where we came from. We're to remember uh, how Jesus made us near to, to God. And we're to remember that now, because of Jesus, we're fellow citizens and members of God's household. So, number one, first, that next slide. So, we're to remember what we were. Here, there, read with me there. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Now, Paul's urging his Gentile readers who lived in Ephesus and throughout the world to remember how they were at one time apart from Christ. Now, often we forget the past, don't we? And oftentimes, I think, uh, sometimes we, we want to forget the past. Now, for some of us, maybe the, your past has been very painful. Um, maybe there's some things that happened to you that you want to forget about. And then there's other of us, and maybe some of the same camp. Uh, when we look back, we are ashamed, maybe, or we feel bad about the choices we made, the things that we did, maybe how we treated other people. Um, now, I, I did a lot of things in my life that I would not be proud of. You know, when I was a junior in high school, uh, my brother and I, we ran away from home. It was pretty stupid. And so we, just in the middle of the night, we was, and it had nothing to do with mom and dad. Mom and dad were great. My sisters were a little weird, but you know, mom, mom, mom and dad were great. So but we just, in the middle of the night, we just thought, let's just, let's just, a lot of it's because the school was boring and I just wanted a change. And it was cold in Iowa where I grew up. So we got up in the middle of the night. We planned it out. A friend of mine, Wild Bill, came with his GTO and parked in front of the, on the gravel road. And we got our stuff and snuck out a window, for heaven's sake. Took our stuff, didn't tell anybody. And the next time we called mom and dad, we're in Florida. And uh, on a pay phone. Didn't have cell phones then. You know? And I remember we just basically put mom and dad hope it's okay to say this in church, through hell. And uh, and I didn't mean to do that. I mean, why would I do that? It's just because, you know, maybe this is a uh, defense, but I was just stupid. And uh, I did, it didn't ever cross my mind, isn't it stupid, of, of the ramifications to my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters. It was all about me. Never even thought about it. Just, this sounds like fun, let's go. 
manna. Anyway, back to the verse. Here he says, remember that you were formerly, um, you were called the uncircumcised. Now, I think when we read that today, we tend to think, well, that's not a big deal. But I think that was not a term of endearment to be called the uncircumcised. And what would be a word that might be similar today? I don't know. I'm no Greek, you know, um, expert. But I think it would probably, today it might be like being called an infidel. So when the Jews looked at the the Gentiles, they were the the infidels. They were the outcasts. They were the people you don't want to associate with. And we'll talk about more of that in in a little bit. Oh, yeah. In the first century, the Jews and the Gentiles were about as divided as uh, the truck drivers and and, uh, the prime minister of Canada. Uh, They really liked each other. You know, I don't know if you guys have followed that at all. Or it's pretty much like... Republicans and Democrats in the United States, not real friendly. <clears throat> Call them names first, ask questions later. That's the way we do it in the U.S., right? Even to our sports friends, you're not, you're not cheering for my team. I can call you names. I can call you anything I want. Now, now God did choose, and we may not like this, he chose Israel all over all the nations of the world. Go to that next slide. Here just as a reminder. And this is out of Deuteronomy 10, verse 15. Yet the, Lord set his, yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Now, so he, now why, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, why did God choose Israel? And is that fair? That doesn't seem fair, does it, that God would choose um, Israel? You know, why not the Irish or the Chinese? Or for heaven's sake, why not Norway? Oli and Sven, you know, ya, yeah, sure. My papa and I, ya. Yeah. Anyway, so why didn't he choose them? He, he, he didn't. He just chose for whatever reason. God has that right, doesn't he? To choose whoever he wants to choose. And he has his purposes. Now, much like I chose Patty. Now, some of you might think that's not fair. You know, some of you are glad that I chose Patty. Um, but, you know, you can't have her. She's mine. <laughs> so now why did God choose Abraham and his descendants? And why did he choose Israel? And next, next slide. Here, uh, Genesis 26, 4 through 5. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. Now, what I want you to notice about that is that, you know, he didn't choose Israel just because Israel was so wonderful. Or he didn't choose you and I because we are just fantastic people. We're, we're really great. He just chose, and he, there was a reason he chose Abraham and his descendants, which included Israel, is why. This verse says why. So that they might be a light to the world. It might be a light to the nations so that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He just chose to do it through the nation of Israel, much like he's chosen to do it through us. You're a Christian. You're a Christ bearer. You're a follower of Jesus. And collectively, we make up the church. God wants to be uh, us to be light bearers so that the rest of the world can be blessed, and not just us. That should help at least maybe a little bit. Here, look, go to the next slide. Here's a timeline. I don't, hopefully you can see it okay. This is a proposed timeline for the history of, of the world, or of, at least of humanity. And I, I want you to notice a couple things. See that red uh, that line there, in the, kind of in the middle? That's where the book of Genesis ends. The story of Genesis ends halfway through human history. Isn't that amazing? You wouldn't think so when you read the Old Testament, would you? Then you see the green line? The green line, that's where Israel became a nation. I'm saying that when they were, uh, when the Exodus happened and they left, we were no longer slaveries, and they came to Mount Sinai. God made a covenant with them. They became the nation of Israel. I'm saying that's the beginning. That's where that green line is. So you could say, well, it doesn't seem right that God would choose Israel to be uh, of all the nations of the earth, but yet, really, he didn't do it until the second half. And then that, see that purple line? That's where Jesus was born. Uh, made that purple, because he's, he's, he's the king of kings. At the 
fullness of the time, Jesus came and he visited the planet Earth. And you, if you look at it, it's almost like the last fourth. Why did God wait so long? I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. That's above my pay grade. I don't even remember what I did yesterday. Okay? So, how would I know? Uh, but that's, that's kind of a timeline. So, so, really, God was using Israel, and they were supposed to be uh, reflecting his glory to the nations. But really, it's not in the big scheme of things. It's only for a period of time. When Jesus came then, now God is trying to do the same thing through the church. Uh, Israel failed sometimes. Sometimes they did well. Sometimes they failed miserably. Uh, same with the church. Sometimes the church through history, we did a pretty good job, of, I think, of reflecting God's glory to the nations. And sometimes we really did a miserable thing. Don't you agree? Just like me, sad to say. I've not always been the, the greatest um, example in the world either. Okay, you know, you know, it got so bad in Jesus' time, you know what the Jews would do? Now there was, after, later, so there was the northern, northern part of Israel were, were Jews, the southern part of Israel were Jews, and then there was a section in, in between called Samaria. That was a mixed breed. And the Jews, they, as time went along, it's kind of sad, rather than being a light to the world, they, they grew in their disdain for Gentiles. Or even if they were part Jew, they wanted nothing to do with them. You know so how they would travel? If you were in southern Israel and you wanted to travel to northern Israel, you know what they would do? They would go, they would go east, cross the Jordan River, go into a foreign land, go north, bypass Samaria, and then go back across the river and go back into northern Israel. Israel to do whatever, see their friends or whatever they're doing. That's one reason why the disciples, when you read the gospel, were shocked. When Jesus traveled, he traveled right through Samaria. And then not only did he travel through Samaria, he stopped at this well and talked to a woman. He is totally nuts. But it does also go to show you how, how perverted we can, as people, can become and how we get off track. Here, look at this next verse. Um, even here, let's just read this, Acts 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. Now this is kind of, a, depending on how you read this, this is a little bit of a sad commentary too. Even when the gospel was going out in the first century and God was really moving um, at the beginning, even the believers, believers in Jesus were amazed. I can't believe it. God wants a relationship with even the Gentiles. You get that? They were amazed. God wants to be with them. He would give them those low lives, the Holy Spirit. you got to be kidding me. You guys are kind of starting to under see, see the, the division between these people. It's kind of like today. It seemed like seem like as the world goes on, we're, we're, it's weird. We pride ourselves, at least some do, pat themselves on the back saying how tolerant they are. But in my lifetime, it's never been so, so much hate, so much violence, and so much separation as ever before. So people are talking this, but they don't live it. You follow? Not much different. Kind of sad. What happened then? Still goes on today, and we think our science science has changed everything. Yeah. Maybe not so much. Okay. Now I don't want to pick on the Jews, so the Gentiles were just as bad, probably, probably even worse than the Jews, and in, in, in their disdain for other people. The Gentiles treated the Jews bad, also. In 19 A.D., Tiberius ordered all the Jews out of Rome. That's a real nice thing to do, isn't it? If you want to make amends. When Titus destroyed the temple in 70 AD, Rome would not allow the Jews to rebuild the temple. You know what they did instead? They built a temple to, uh, uh, for Jupiter. And then what they do? They tax the Jews to pay for it. You think that there was any hostility on the, on the, on the side of the, of the Jews for that? The, I think they would interpret it, you guys don't give a rip. We could die and we could probably care less. And it might be true. I feel like I'm getting some of the politics today. 
Now, some of these hostilities continued on for centuries. I don't need to mention Adolf Hitler. Um, and today, in New York City, the, the violence against Jews has increased something like they said 300% or 600%, I can't remember it was. Um, a lot of bad things going on. Myself, I'm guilty. Right after I became a Christian, I, I was li living in Ames, Iowa, and there was this old um, fraternity house. It was called Alpha Omega. So a bunch of us Christians lived in there. And I remember, I was, you've got to remember, I'm just a, a farm hick, very uncultured. And then I was eating, we were eating, sitting at this table, there was probably like 30 guys. And right across from me is this guy named Eugene, who is from New York City. He, I still, to this day, I see some movies with his name on them credits. Went to the school of Juilliard. He was, a, he was he's a Jew. I think I said that. So I'm sitting there. Can you believe this? This is how ignorant I was. I'm sitting there eating and then I was talking about buying something. And then I, I, then I used this phrase. I said, I, 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 I dealt with this guy and I jewed him down. And I jewed him down to this amount and I bought it. And I was just still eating. Didn't think a word thing about it. And uh, Eugene was sitting there and he just stopped eating and just staring at me. I didn't notice that. And I looked up and said, uh, what? I said, what did you say? I said, I, then, then when I repeated it, I realized what I said. I, uh, yeah, I uh, <laughs> drew them down. I never, even, honestly, I never even realized what that, you know, I just phrase it sometimes and say, we never thought, that's it. I never think of you down with G, you know? That's stupid, I know, but I never did. And I remember that. Make a mental note, Gary. <laughs> don't, don't say that anymore. And uh, so I'm guilty. Probably all of us are in different ways, aren't we? So uh, here, so uh, back to that next slide. If you will. Remember what we were. Remember that at that time we were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. And next slide, so here it says, so what are the things that it's saying? In the past, you and I were separated from Christ. And the next one, we were excluded from the commonwealth. Now, when we became a part of the commonwealth, we get the benefits of that kingdom. Like, it's like, I guess, it's a whole, I don't know if they view it as a benefit anymore, but Puerto Rico, when they were part of the United States property. They were protected by us. Hopefully they still think of it as a benefit. I don't know. Um, well, uh, we became citizens of the commonwealth, so we're no longer, you know, when we become citizens of the commonwealth of Israel, or we become part of the kingdom of God, that also makes it uh, makes us strangers and foreigners to, to the world system. Understand that. You can't have it both ways. You either belong to the God, or you belong to the kingdom of darkness. It's one or the other. You, some people try to live both ways. It ain't going to work. So when we give our lives to Christ, uh, we're then, the rest of the world sees us as weird, strange, like we don't belong. And oftentimes, they'll they treat us that way, and they will treat us that way. And the next one, we were foreigners to the covenants. You know, the covenants through the Bible were predominantly through Israel. And then we were without hope. Even if I, you know, I feared God and I wanted to join the, uh, to, to please God and obey the commandments, I would still be an outsider. And we'll look at that here in just a minute. And then we were without God. God was distant. He was far off. Even when I tried to do right and seek I would fail, and I'd fail miserably. I know I'm not the only one. Okay, here, number two. We need to remember that now we've been made near. Here it says in verses 13 and 14, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Isn't that fantastic? He's brought us near. Jesus made all the difference for you and I. We have been brought near by what? 
by the blood of Christ. He was our sacrificial lamb. He made the two groups one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. So now what is that dividing wall? It probably, probably means a couple of things, but let's go to that next slide. I think it also includes this. So there, here, this is a model of, of the temple in Jerusalem um, in the first century. And I want you to notice on the left there is the court of the Gentiles. So in that day, whether that was God's plan or not, this is how they did it. If you were a you were not Jew, if you were a Gentile, you were not allowed into the inner courts of the temple. So, you know, if you were an unbeliever in those days, uh, or, or, and you feared, or you became, you saw the error of your ways, you wanted to be close to God, uh, you became a Jew, you started uh, a proselyte to the Jewish faith, um, and then you think, I might want to uh, amend my wrongs, I want to, you know, obey God, and I want to offer sacrifices to God. Well, you couldn't even go into the temple. You had to stay on the outside. That would be kind of a bummer. One. I thought, you know, I, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not the same. Doesn't God? Didn't God create us all? Aren't we the same? And you guys, how come I can't? I, I mean, I'll respect. I'll even keep my mouth shut. I won't say anything. I just want to go in there and offer to God a sacrifice. Can't, I can't do that. Um, but that's the way it was. And the Jews aren't the only ones. So I don't want to blame them. You know, the Muslims are no different. And some of our clubs are the same way. You have to, you know, some of them I wonder, what do they do? And nobody knows. It's a secret, you know, behind closed doors. Now, we don't want the church to be that way, do we? God wants to break down these the barriers of this dividing wall. So not anymore. Jesus changed everything. Um, so when it, Think about that too. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn in two. He, his death, made it possible for anyone, you or Gentile, to enter right into God's presence. So we, you and I can have a fellowship with God. Isn't that fantastic? And sometimes I think if we don't understand the history, we don't understand, we don't understand the greatness of what Jesus did for us. It's just kind of vague. We read these verses, but it doesn't really make sense to us. Um, I'm going to read a little short story here, if you would. Um, in France, in World War II, uh, some GIs lost their buddy in a battle. They carried uh, their buddy to a little cemetery. They found a priest who spoke broken English, and they said, You know, if it's possible, sir, we would like to bury our, our, our buddy in the cemetery so he could at least have the dignity of a grave in a place that will be somewhat kept. <clears throat> in broken English, the priest asked, um, is he Catholic? And they said, no. And he said, I'm sorry, he cannot be buried here. This is a Catholic cemetery. Well, they were disheartened and discouraged, and they went on their way. They hadn't walked very far when they said, let's do the next best thing. And in the darkness of that night, they buried him just on the outside of the, uh, of the fence to the cemetery, this Catholic cemetery. And uh, then they, they went a little ways, they slept. And in the morning, before they left, they wanted to give their last respects to their buddy. So they went to where they thought the, bar the body was buried, and they couldn't find it. So they, in desperation, they went to the priest, said, you know, we, we, we know we buried him right outside the fence, and we can't find him. Then the priest confessed, I couldn't sleep last night after I told you that. So in the la later in that night, what I did is I went out and moved the fence to include your buddy into the cemetery. I thought, that's what Jesus did. Jesus moved the fence. He, uh, he made it possible so that we could be included and not be excluded from everything from eternity, eternity our life with God. Isn't that fantastic? It's Jesus did that for you and I. Here, so, you know, for a, a Gentile to enter into that temple was serious business. That would mean some, it would mean death. We will put you to death. Here, this next slide is an example. Read this with me. Men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks, for heaven's sake, into the temple and has defiled this holy place. 
for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So what did they want to do? He defiled the temple. He, both of them, deserved to die. And I think this still had probably a big part in why they eventually did get Paul. They arrested them and they did kill him. No, it's not this reason only, but this didn't help. So there was a, I want us to understand, there was a real divide between Jew and Gentile. And that helps us to see what Jesus did for us. Okay. Now that next slide. So we already read the, these verses, I think. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. So what or who breaks the barriers? Who is Who does that? Jesus does. That's important. And who breaks the barriers today? Jesus does. He's the Prince of Peace. I like that old phrase, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, no peace. No Jesus, N-O, no Jesus, no peace. He's the Prince of Peace. People in the world, we try to make a, our little utopia without God, without Jesus. Good luck. It doesn't work very good. Um, here, notice this next next slide here. Here it says, um, verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having been put to, put to death the enmity. Now I want you to notice this, this these verses. It says, or at least it implies, the enmity that exists between the Jews and the Gentiles uh, was connected to the law of commandments. You see that? Part of the source of contention, probably not the only thing, but part of the source of contention was the fact that the G Gentiles did not keep the law. And so the Jews looked on them with disdain. You guys don't, this is a, uh, our blessed law that we received from, directly from God, and you guys aren't keeping it, um, and we, we are not, we are disgusted that you don't do that. So we, we're going to shun you. And then there's also, like even today, there's some who they blame Christians and they blame Jews for their feeling guilty. They'll say things like, it's because of you I feel guilty. I wouldn't feel guilty for doing this or that. It's because of you guys. You, take, you, you guys are taking this law and you're enslaving us and you're uh, affecting our lifestyle. We, we don't have the freedom to do this. We don't have the freedom to do that. And it's all your fault. And they get, they get hostile, don't they? So they, they blame us for the guilt. Now you think, what about, could it not be a conscience? Maybe you really are doing wrong. And God gave you a conscience, and it's not really my fault, but it's just, it's what, but you're not willing to admit that, right? They, they want to do whatever they want to do. Um, and oftentimes, isn't it true, that what they want to do leads to an immoral lifestyle? Oftentimes, it's because... Um, uh, they say sex outside of marriage is fine, as long as you don't hurt anybody. As long as you love, as long it's just love. They say, don't they? But I would say, if you read history. They say we don't believe in science. But if you read history, and you understand science. Probably the most destructive thing in the West, in the United States history, is that very area, area of immorality. Sex outside of marriage has been more destructive, I would say, than probably anything else. And it's history. You can read it. But most ignore it and cover it up. Okay, the next slide. Here's a picture. This is a picture of some in a seminary in the United States. Okay, I'm not going to tell you the name of the seminary because I'm not trying to pick on them. But they are praying to plants and confessing their sin. Uh, they don't believe the Bible is completely inspired. They think it was written by sinful men and that you have to figure out what part is from God and what part is not. Kind of convenient, isn't it? Yeah, I don't like this part. Yeah, I don't think God wrote that. Yeah. Go cut that out. That's the way I'd probably do it. 
maybe they're better. They kind of pride themselves in, um, in being tolerant and inclusive, much like our society today, right? And then they say this, and they, they say this, at least in my opinion, it sounds kind of like they're boasting. One day you may come in and find a traditional Anglican communion. Another day you may enter into a service of, of Buddhist meditation or Muslim prayer, a spokesperson continued. Another you may find a Pentecostal praise service or a silent Quaker meeting. We create a home where people can worship side by side in traditions similar to and very different to their own. Um, first thing I'd like to say, be very careful with people who, who um, boast about their goodness. Right? Hopefully you've learned that. Oftentimes those who say certain things or accuse other people of, of wrong are the most guilty themselves. Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Wow, these guys, these guys are really sensitive. They even feel bad when to confess their sins to plants. I'm not like that. I'm just, I'm just going to eat them. Um, but, okay, but here's the test. Um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a graduate student of this seminary in 1939. He was fighting Nazism in Germany, was resisting Adolf Hitler. And he came wanted to get away from Nazi Germany, came to the U.S., he went to his home seminary and spoke to them about God and sin and the need for repentance. And how do they treat him? Do you think they treated him with, with uh, tolerance and open arms? Do you think so? No. They laughed at him and scorned him. And he was so discouraged, he thought, I mean, if I was uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, I'd probably think the whole world's gone to hell. Uh, we have this fantastic, you know, crazy dictator in Germany, my beloved homeland. I come here to the States, and this is how they treat me. I, and uh, there, he probably thought, this is this has got to be the end of the world. When do you think I would think that? And uh, so he went back. He kept fighting against Nazism and, and, and Hitler. And one month, they arrested him, of course, one month before the Allies set, set, set everybody free, he was executed. But I bet you that guy has a great place in the kingdom of heaven. Anyway, one thing, just the last thought about this, it's kind of amazing about human nature. You know, um, we will worship with Muslims, Buddhists, Pentecostals, Quakers, anybody will confess our sins to plants, but if anybody comes here and tells me that I need to repent and confess my sins to Almighty God, hell will freeze over before I do that. Understand? They're going to be shocked on the judgment day when they stand before. They see on the throne of judgment is the very person they use as a person, Jesus Christ. I can't imagine. Okay, number three. We read, oh, here, I skipped a verse here. First, yeah, the next, next, next the slide before that, 17. Uh, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access to one spirit through the Father. And that great, Jesus is, is a great guy. He came, he preached peace to the Jew and to the Gentile, to everybody to bring them t together. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to do it in our world today. Um, but it's, we're resisting. We're fighting against the very one who would really bring true peace. And we're using substitutes. Okay, next slide. Remember now, this is fantastic. Now we're fellow citizens. And that Gentiles, even though we're Gentiles and we're excluded, or they've excluded us for centuries, now, Jesus has made us um, fellow citizens along with them. Here. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We are not only citizens, ladies and gentlemen, we're family. Isn't that fantastic? Jesus called us brothers. 
At least it's recorded that in Hebrews chapter 2. That's fantastic. The next slide. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Wow. Fantastic. Here, but when we close up here, one last question. Do you have your faith and hope in Jesus Christ and in him only? Have you humbled yourself? And accepted the fact that you have done wrong. Will you confess your need for a Savior, Jesus Christ? Ladies and gentlemen, do not, do not put your faith in goodness, trying to impress people. They won't give a rip in you. Be honest, please. Turn, repent from our sins, turn to God, put your faith in Jesus. It would be the best by far thing you'll ever do. And then you could be included in this great kingdom. It's coming soon. Can you imagine? We're going to see God. God took on human form, Jesus Christ. I'm going to see God in a physical body here somewhere, one of these future dates. And as old as I am, not too long from now. And I'll be able to go up and, and <laughs> oh, grab him. I'll try not to grab him from behind like I do you guys. I, I, I'll be able to grab him and talk to him touch him, and it, it's, you know, understand it, it's going to be fantastic. God, if God didn't take out in human form, if he was just sitting, if he was just a spirit, sitting on some glassy throne with angels, it's good. I, I, it'd be wonderful that he saved me, but it's just like, uh, okay, I understand you created me, uh, you care about me, but I, it's hard to comprehend what grace is, and what mercy is, and what love is. You know, and I said, well, what do I do now? How do I have a relationship with this all-powerful, all-knowing person? But when he took on human body, oh, this is, this is cool. He's one of us. I can have a relationship with him. And it will be forever. Forever. Man, you, you want to be a part of that. You want to be a part of that. Okay, let's just thank the Lord to stop. Lord, I just really thank you for Ephesians chapter 2. It's awesome. Lord, you are awesome. You are wonderful. Thank you for all that you did for us. How could we ever thank you? Thank you for letting me be a part of um, the kingdom of God, to be a part with Israel, to be chosen by God. Man, it's fantastic. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I know I don't deserve it, but no one, no one does. But you are so wonderful. Thank you all you've done. Thank you for this time. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time.